I cannot believe that we have already come to our final session together in our series on Jesus in the Old Testament. Remember when we started, I, I told you, though it's logical to think this way, Jesus did not have his beginning when he was born in Bethlehem. Jesus, like God the Father, God the Spirit, God the Son, Jesus Christ, is eternal. He never has not existed. He never will not exist. That's why the Bible says Jesus the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And the advantage that comes from that to us, his followers, nothing takes him by surprise. There's nothing in this world that he hasn't experienced, seen for himself. Eternity is a really, really, really long time, especially compared to the shortness of our life. If, if we're fortunate, we get 70, 80, handful of people make 90 years, uh, 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 very few make 100. Compare that to eternity. And why would we not listen to him? Why would we not trust him based on everything that he's seen, experienced, and a lot of it participated in himself? So this series, it's a lot more than a history lesson. It's about how we live today. It's about how we approach tomorrow. Session six, we're going to look at the captivity and the coming kingdom. We're going to cover the remaining historical books, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. You know, if you start reading in Genesis and you just read the first 17 books and you go all the way up to Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and then you stop, even though you've only read 17 of the 39 Old Testament books, you finish the plot line. You finish the storyline of the Old Testament. Those prophets fit back into the storyline. The books of poetry, the writings, they fit back into the storyline. So Ezra and Nehemiah Esther brings us to the end of the storyline, the plot of the Old Testament. We also have a few prophets who ministered during this time. We'll talk about them as we go through this. But let's pick up the story where we left off. Remember, the United Kingdom, Saul, David, Solomon, Solomon, divided heart, half heart, leads to a period of time called the divided kingdom. Mostly bad kings. While the kingdom splits between the north and the south, Israel and Judah, it's a tough time. The northern kingdom has no good leaders. And so, as you might predict, they fall first. The Assyrians come in and they conquer the northern kingdom, 722 B.C., and they take them and they scatter them all over the empire. Pretty good strategy. They think if we, if we displace them from their homeland, if we scatter them over, if we then repopulate where we took them from, then everybody's going to be a lot less likely to rebel. Pretty smart strategy. The southern kingdom watches this, and while their neighbors to the north cry for help, help! We're being attacked. The southern kingdom goes, we will. And they come and they actually help the enemy. That's how deep the conflict was when family tears against family. And so Babylonia comes in and they conquer Judah. Goodbye, southern kingdom. And they don't scatter them. Instead, they scoop up the best and the brightest, especially of, of the next generation. And they exile them back to Babylonia. This is when we have the writings of Ezekiel and Daniel. Um, you know, it's like, welcome to Babylonia. You're going you're gonna to love it here. We got some new foods you'll want to try. We got some new customs. Oh, oh, by the way, you need to not worship your God. You need to worship our gods now. And, and if, if not, we may put you to death for that. But anyway, we're really glad you're here. Welcome. You're going to love it here. The prophets exercised ministry and said, don't compromise. Don't give in. Don't let the surrounding culture pour you into its mold. Well, eventually God raises up a third world power called Persia, and Persia lets Judah go home, not because they're trying to make God's prophecy come true. King of Persia is smart. He's like, what are we worried about a little wimp strip of land like Israel for? We ought to be worried about Egypt. Let them go home. If the Egyptians ever attack us, there'll be a buffer zone. In the meantime, we'll tax them like crazy. All the trade routes go through there, but let them go home. It's time to have peace. And some of the Jews go home. A lot of them stay right where they are because 70 years they've been in Babylonia. But that's this period of time. And during this period of time, then when they're back in the land, that's when Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, the last three prophets of the Old Testament, 
God still hasn't given up on his people. He's still talking about the coming Messiah. In your readings this week, your time of, of discovery, you're going to explore the idea of the Son of Man. What does that term mean? Jesus applied it to himself. Where'd that come from? You'll discover that this week. It's in the Old Testament. The idea of having a new heart. Where does that vocabulary come from? Jesus didn't come up with it in the Gospels. It goes farther back than that. The branch and the signet ring as signs of authority. There's clear parallels with that in Jesus' ministry. The one who was pierced. Zechariah describes Jesus as the one who was pierced. He says a lot of other things, too. He says he'll, he'll come in riding on a, on a donkey, not a big white horse like you'd expect a king. Because Jesus didn't come as a conquering king the first time. He came as a suffering servant. It predicts that Jesus will be sold for 30 pieces of silver, that the, that the sheep will be scattered after that, just like comes true with his disciples. And all through this, there's the idea of there will be mourning, but then there will be repentance. It's not the end because our God always finishes what he starts. There's also the picture of Jesus as the messenger of the covenant, the fulfillment of the promise all the way back in our first session to Father Abraham and repeated to different people along. Finally, that covenant is fulfilled. More than anything else, I believe this section, this, this um, restoration time, this captivity and then the coming back, and, and the prediction of the coming kingdom. You can't have a kingdom without a king. And I think just jumps off the pages of all of these stories is Jesus presented as king. Remember first we learned that Jesus is creator. Then we talked to him as sacrifice. Then we talked about him as redeemer, like Boaz was to Ruth. Then we, we talked to him uh, about being a shepherd, as David described. Last session, we talked about him as healer. And this final session, we're going to learn about Jesus as king. A number of passages to look at. One of those would be in the book of Zechariah. And if you're like me and most Christ followers, you probably don't hang out in Zechariah uh, a whole lot. You may need to stop in your table of contents and, and find it, but it's almost to the end of the Old Testament. In Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10 say this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey. On a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. This is a marvelous prophecy, but it's a little bit confusing and, and this is what caused the people some trouble because Jesus didn't appear to be the Messiah they were expecting. They're expecting a political deliverer, somebody who will take the powerful Roman Empire and push it off and give them freedom. They've been subjugated by Assyria and Babylonia and Persia and, and then Greece and a while they're independent and by Jesus' time they're under the iron boot of Rome. And they're ready for political, military deliverance. And this meek, this meek servant, this healer, this teacher, this miracle worker, refuses to use his own power for his own glory. And he just doesn't meet their concept of what Messiah will be. I don't know if you've ever been to the Smoky Mountains. I thought there was only one mountain range, and it was the Rockies. And I still love the Rockies. But here in the southeast, the Smoky Mountains, they have their own kind of beauty. And one thing that you'll, you'll notice there, I, we've been to the Billy Graham Cove up in Asheville several times, and there's a big porch, and there's like a couple dozen rocking chairs, and there's an ice cream, soft ice cream machine. It's a sweet place, as well as great teaching and worship, of course. But you look out there, and there's all these ridge lines, 
And sometimes you can see five or six rows. And as you look at that, you get the impression that those ridge lines are like maybe three feet from each other because our eyes compress that just like a telephoto lens does um, when, you're, when you're photographing things. That's what happened with the prophets. It's as if they were actually talking about two ridges, the time when Jesus would come first as a suffering servant, and then they'll turn around and they'll prophesy about his second coming as the conquering king. But you know, when you're looking that far in the future, and I'm not even sure if the prophets fully understood this, there can actually be a big gap, a long valley between those two things, but our eyes bring them together. And so the blurring of those caused so many people to miss Jesus as Messiah because he didn't meet their pre preconceived ideas. He didn't fulfill their expectations. Well, this is really described for us in, in Zechariah, these two different kinds of Messiah, all though in one person. And Paul picks up this and he, he develops it beautifully in the book of Philippians. It's interesting too how this conversation comes about. It didn't just start because Paul's like, well, you know, we've talked about some practical stuff. Now let me throw in a little doctrine. Um, you know, we've talked about your behavior. Now let's talk about your beliefs. This grows out. You look at chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. There's conflict. They're arguing about who's the greatest. They're putting their own needs first. And Paul says, stop that. But then it's as if the light bulb goes on and he's like, let me, let me motivate him. This will do it. And he turns in verse 5 and he shifts the focus to Jesus. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." When Jesus came the first time, this is what he did. He humbled himself. Imagine leaving heaven and coming to earth, not just as a human, not just as part of the creation that you spoke into existence, but as a dependent little baby born into a borrowed feed trough in an obscure little village. Talk about humbling yourself. Not only did he humble himself, Paul says he emptied himself. He gave up the independent use of the attributes of the power, the authority that belonged to him. I mean, what does this mean? Uh, some of it even kind of gets humorous to me. I picture his half-brothers playing hide-and-go-seek. He, he's counting to 100, and he's like, oh, please, James, seriously, down in, in the ridge by that, by that old cave. It's like, that cave's been here since generations. I know every inch of this property. Why are you wasting your time? No, no. He had sacrificed that. When he walked from Jericho to Jerusalem, he got tired. His feet probably hurt. If they were new sandals, he probably got blisters. He gave up the power that was rightfully his, even the power to choose his own course. Instead, submitting himself to the will of his heavenly father. That's what Jesus did. That's why Paul says if he did that, then how can we all the time demand our own way? That's Jesus at his first coming. But then Paul goes on. We, we pick up the account in verse 9. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Wow. Because he made himself low, completed his Father's task, came, died, paid the penalty for our sins, the Father highly exalted him, giving him the name above every name, not just a king, but the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Jesus is the king. He's going to come a second time, and 
We can argue about the timing of that. Jesus real clearly says you're not going to know the time. Anybody who tells you they figured out the date, you ought to run really far and fast from them because the scripture says we're not going to know. We ought to plan as if it could be a thousand years from now and we ought to live as it could be in the next instant. That's what scripture tells us. We may argue about when is it, what events have to happen first. Forget all of that for this course. The point is Jesus is coming again. And this time he's not going to be on a borrowed donkey. This time he's not going to be born in a manger. This time he's coming as king. And there's no passage that describes that, I don't believe, any better than Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 16. John is writing, and he says this, Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And here it comes full circle. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe, get this part, and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. When Jesus comes the second time, he's coming as a king. He will finally be recognized, not just by us who voluntarily choose to follow him, He'll be acknowledged as king by everyone. Even those who resisted him the most will have to acknowledge he really is who he claimed to be. Don't wait until you don't have a choice. God's looking for a relationship. He's looking for love. He's, he's not just looking to dominate. He's not demanding submission. Clear back in Genesis, God created us for a relationship. And that relationship, that choice to love is, is where we want to be. Yes, he's coming back, and he's coming back as a king. That's how he was described very many times by the prophets in the Old Testament. It's previewed. It starts clear back in Genesis. And now here we are in the last book of the Bible, almost in the final chapter. And God ties it all back together like he's going to do someday in the future. Jesus in the Old Testament, he's the creator. He's also the sacrifice. Our sin demanded a sacrifice. God's holiness required a sacrifice, but God doesn't just require it. God provides it in his son, Jesus Christ. Not only is he the creator and the sacrifice, he's the redeemer, like Boaz redeemed Ruth, like God took the people out of slavery and bondage in Egypt. Yes, he's the creator, he's the sacrifice, he's the redeemer, he's also the shepherd. Because all of us like sheep tend to wander, we tend to get ourselves in trouble. And so he guides us, he protects us, he provides for us. And he's the healer. He's the one who can fix not only physical ailments, he's the one who can heal our minds, heal our broken hearts, He's the one who can even resurrect us when we are dead, either physically or spiritually. And finally, he's the king. He came the first time to suffer and pay the price for our sins. But someday, he's coming back as king. And this time, he's going to rule. And he's going to fix everything that went wrong clear back as early as the first chapters of Genesis. But he's not just going to repair it. He's going to recreate it. And it's going to be better than it ever was in, back clear in the beginning. God created us for a relationship. And the entire story of the Bible is after we rebelled. And make no mistake, I've rebelled and so have you against God. 
God calls us back into relationship with himself. And someday he'll be king and then no more sin, no more suffering, no more sickness, no more worry. It's going to be glorious to live as citizens of his kingdom. So there you have it. Jesus in the Old Testament, six big portraits. Jesus as creator, Jesus as sacrifice, Jesus as redeemer, Jesus as shepherd, Jesus as healer, and finally, Jesus as king. You know, the amazing part is we only picked one out of five in each of the sessions. We could have had 30 of these. There's so many great pictures from Genesis all the way through Malachi, all the way to the end of the book. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've been challenged to live with confidence in the presence because the Jesus we serve is eternal. Nothing takes him by surprise, and he's your Savior. He's your Lord if you let him be. I hope we get to share another learning adventure in the future as we continue our journey through this amazing book called the Bible. We'll see you next time.